first thing I want to show you today is a particular type of brush which you may or may not know about and uh, the brush looks a bit like this. You may see, have seen brushes like this in shops and wonder, and it's thin brush with uh, a longer, longer fibers, longer brush area than you would normally see. And you might look at that and say, well, that's quite difficult to control. So let's compare it to uh, a standard brush length. You can see it's a little longer, a little thinner. And uh, you may have wondered what's that used for. And uh, it's called a rigger brush. And uh, it was originally created to paint the rigging on ships. So the rigging being all the ropes coming off sailing ships, off the sails, things. So they created a brush that could create consistent, long, thin lines. So that's what a rigger brush is used for. So if you've been using it for blocking in uh, shapes and stuff, then you haven't actually been using it for what it was meant to do, although that's no crime. But um, that's what a rigger brush is for. So we're going to have a go at uh, trying that out and why you would try it. And so, first of all, give it a go here. So this is me just drawing a line with the rigger brush. I try not to press too hard on the table. I've talked about before having too much friction with the table. Uh, when you're trying to do smooth kind of lines, but this is me just playing around with the rigger brush like that. So nice long thin lines. So I'm actually doing this with gouache. And I'll explain why, although it's originally designed for watercolor and. You can see there, just got my gouache a little wetter. Okay, so if you're kind of having trouble getting consistent line, a rigger brush is actually something worth trying. And the reason why you would maybe use that instead of a standard smaller brush is if you think about when you're using. A smaller brush like so the uh, where the brush is touching the paper is not far away from the stem or the handle of the brush so it's going to pick up differences in pressure that you're making more than the rigger brush does because this part of the brush is closer to the sand. So if I suddenly press too hard or I wobble a bit, it actually picks that up a bit more. Whereas with the rigger brush, where the rigger brush is making contact with the brush, uh, with the with the paper, it's a bit further away from the handle. So it's just not quite so sensitive to your movements as the smaller brush would be. So even if you your pressure changes a little bit, it won't necessarily change as much on the line. So it just means your line is likely to be more consistent uh, as you're working. So in a set, even though it's a longer brush and you think because it's longer, it may actually uh, be harder con to control for its purpose. It's actually easier to control for the purpose of generally straight lines and the consistency is much better in terms of the width of your line as well okay so that's why you might use a rigger brush where it doesn't work so well is when your line has to uh, become more varied so when you have to start curving or making little loops and things you lose a bit of control because of the length of it it's not necessarily great for uh, 
little linear details or varied linear shapes. But for long lines, uh, straight lines or slightly curved lines over a greater length, it's great. But don't necessarily use it for little loops and curls and things like that. And the reason why I am uh, have been using a rigger brush is uh, what I've been working on this uh, last couple of weeks is I don't know about you, but after about week nine of lockdown, I came to a kind of creative halt and uh, got a bit down in the dumps. And uh, usually, when that happens, I try and whatever I'm doing creatively, I try and pare it down to the bare minimum of what I'm asking myself to do and what I'm focusing on uh, and just trying to keep things simple. So I decided uh, I just want to do kind of simple things and I looked at nature as we've looked at before in our class. I looked at nature and uh, I decided to just keep it to kind of silhouettes or variations of silhouettes of natural uh, shapes and uh, the rigger brush came in handy for doing stems or branches and things like that. So uh, I originally started working in gouache and it's just a suggestion of mine for this week is to maybe look at nature um, and uh, just a single gouache colour mixed a colour and created that uh, and I've been thinking about just working relatively small so this is actually A5 and also thinking about cropping not so much in this image but uh, trying to create kind of quite dramatic images but with just very simple things so a simple part of a plant uh, some leaves perhaps but how I then arrange those on the paper so in this instance this was just trying out uh, the painting and kind of initially exploring but then looking at how I might use the paper in a dynamic way and I found like just taking a simple part of a plant but not necessarily showing it all and having it quite dramatically set on the page sometimes diagonals can be very interesting but filling out the page uh, the sheet of paper as well so again this is a single uh, gouache colour. You can see where I've used the rigger brush for the stem uh, and I'll talk about what brush I used uh, for the leaves a bit later on but I found this incredibly therapeutic <laughs> to do, uh, pleasant to do and then it got me very interested in just thinking about what little variations you could do without moving too far away from this basic setup. So think about what plant and nature is great for this because it provides us a variety of shapes. So I think what's in, nice about this is the thickness of the leaves, although these are thin leaves, but the contrast between the stems and the leaves themselves. Uh, nice contrast of, of shapes like that and how those shapes can dance around onto the page. So just a piece of parsley in the kitchen or some basil leaves, uh, anything in the garden or if and I know some of you won't have a garden, won't have it, just go online or look in a garden book and uh, find interesting things and just keeping it simple like that. But variations that you could do, so this is full gouache painting, you know, nice and thick, maybe a couple of layers, uh, but then I then deliberately kind of washed it down. Uh, so here's a part where I ref didn't put a second layer on and then as I and I started at the bottom with these leaves and as I moved up I added more and more water so the colors uh, got lighter and also with gouache I find what's nice about gouache is you're more likely to get these textures with gouache where the brush strokes are really clear and uh, I found those rather interesting. Uh, so even within a simple shape, you get a beautiful texture and that's actually, there's quite a lot to kind of look at there, even though it's a, it's a very simple 
uh, on a setup like that. Um, so just going dark to light. So you can start with a silhouette and then think, what if I have some leaves light and some leaves light? And this is where we move away from pure observation. And I think this is where it becomes creatively interesting as well as you have your subject matter. But then you say, well, I'll make these leaves lighter and these darker, even if that's not the actual case of what they look like in reality. So this is somewhat invented, still feels plausible, but um, an invented little variation. And again, having not, thing, not fitting it in. And one of the things I like about cropping is the suggestion that there's a life for the plant beyond your page. I think that or whatever subject that you have. I always think that's an interesting dynamic. Okay, so there was a variation there. Likewise, this one, this is a little willow branch. Um, I might just come back to the focus a bit there. Here, yeah, just similarly made my leaves lighter, but this was with uh, full painting gua, so not a water wash. So adding white to the leaves with each leaf as I went upwards uh, on on the branch, like so. And again, using the rigor brush, uh, and you can see faint pencil lines. So if you're wondering, like, have you painted those uh, or drawn them first, or just painted them straight off? These are drawn. Some are drawn, some are not, and it's worth exploring both. And I think as you get, if you've drawn a few plants and get used to drawing it, you might start to try it without uh, pencil marks. But initially, definitely a bit of pencil uh, will uh, help. Um, so as well as variations of getting a little lighter, then also think about different hues. So whether, and this is where uh, you can expand compositions. Um, and look at slightly different shades. So with this one, a darker shade and then a slightly more, so a darker bluer green and then a slightly more yellow green and uh, quite make a good wallpaper of that. Uh, like so, and then also varying, particularly with gouache, and this is something I like about gouache, it's varying where you have it very flat and where you have it slightly more textured. So you might have two elements, two clear elements within a page and one is painted flat in one colour and one might be painted in another colour but slightly varied as well. So just continue my exploration of that, but introducing slightly different colours into it um, equally here. Slightly unfinished one, but again different colours and textures, so where it's a little wetter and so on. Here's a couple more. So this is uh, clematis leaves. So these are actually in my garden. Uh, and I took this leaf cluster here and painted it and one of the interesting things with leaves in particular is uh, not always just painting them flat but seeing if you can find them curled in some way because there's often a difference in shade between the front and the back the front often being uh, stronger in color or darker and the back sometimes being lighter and that can give um, interesting variations and here just little subtle variations of colour. So I did this one first and then I tried this one and I like bits of both. Either is perfect for me, but I like bits of both in there. And actually these leaves up here are kind of just invented. So this was the original composition then. And then just think about scale, having some things big and th some things smaller. But you might have a starting point, but actually start to invent and create around that starting point. Point. So not always just working purely from observation. And the other thing is also simplifying things. So um, taking away maybe shade, light and shade in some aspects, 
uh, and being a little more graphic can be an interesting uh, thing to do. Okay, and this one, this is just little things. I'm not such a fan of this one. I think I prefer the previous ones, but worth experimenting where you might bring, again, the use of the rigger brush where you might bring uh, little details in uh, and you might take that a bit further in bringing a bit more line detail in to what you're doing. Um, one of uh, the other thing, the other brushes I've been using are Chinese brushes. So here's a couple of Chinese brushes here. I'm just going to wet this one. And these I've been using when uh, painting the leaves in particular. I've been using other brushes as well, but these are a good example. And uh, one of the things I, want, I think I have touched upon this during the course is how we're using our brush to create different types of shapes. And uh, one thing I, I think and I hope I've encouraged, and if I haven't, I slap myself on the hand, is using the full length of the brush, the base and the tip, and using those uh, whilst painting, and how you can use the shape of the brush to help create your shape. It's not always uh, possible, it's depending on the types of shapes that you're, you're creating. Um, and for leaves, Chinese brushes are worth um, looking at because uh, a Chinese brush originally would be used for calligraphy uh, as well as drawing or painting um, and they're designed to be able to create linear sequences as well as filling in shapes uh, so that's why classical Chinese brush will be quite thick and broad lots of fibers uh, but also be a little more tapered so that you have a longer bit at the end so it's very good at creating line as well as shape and being able to interchange between line and shape easily and uh, this is why it's useful if you're wondering what i'm doing i've got my paint here um this is why it's useful for things like um leaves in particular because it leaves taper uh, so having the ability to be able to create a shape quickly that goes from thin to, to thick so even with quite a thick brush like this because of the long tapering i'm still confident to create relatively thin lines but i can also create broad shapes as well so i can create leaves like that that have nice tapering to them but i can do it in almost single or one to two or three strokes very quickly um great if you're you know working in ink and watercolor uh, in particular and normally chinese brushes would be used with ink specifically um not necessarily ideal for gouache, but you can do, you might not have gouache at home. Uh, having said that, you might not have a Chinese brush at home, but you might be able to get one. Um, but you can, it's quite nervous doing this, I'm still nervous. Um, you can see how that kind of works, a bit of pooling there because it's a big brush and, and another reason Chinese brushes are quite large and thick is so they can hold a lot of uh, liquid uh, and be used uh, to create a lot of shapes and lines and not have to dip back in uh, all the time into your uh, material okay so using the brush even if you don't have this type of brush you can still work like this with uh, a standard brush so let's get brush more like the ones we've been using and you can still think in those terms in term in making leaf shapes how you might 
instead of necessarily doing this where you draw the line of the leaf and then paint it in, that's fine. It's not so fine if you're using watercolour ink and that's going to take you a long time. So by the time you come to paint in there, the line is dried and you get unevenness uh, in terms. Fine for gouache because you may be laying on top and doing that, but I think it's worth looking at um, just practicing how you can do leaf shapes. And again, it's I mentioned before going with the direction of the brush itself rather than working across the brush at that point pointing the brush to the direction you want it to go uh, and then using the whole length of the brush from base uh, to tip um, that doesn't mean you do the whole leaf like that you might get then get a smaller brush to touch it up or start using the point and and you might vary around and basically find a way that works for you but well worth exploring how you're using the brush uh, like that for this type of thing. Um, so as some of you might not have gouache or might not particularly want to work uh, with gouache, I have been doing uh, these experimentations with other materials. So for example, here is, not that one, Let me get the right one, okay. Here are a couple of examples here, and uh, you can unmute yourself for a moment, those of you who want to, and tell me which one is made with ink and which one is made with watercolour. Ink on the left. So you think this yeah. one is ink, and this one is watercolour. And watercolour on the right. Watercolor on the right, this one, yeah. Mm. Maybe, yeah. The reverse. Not sure. Okay, this one is watercolor. Yeah, yeah. This one is watercolor. <laughs> this one is ink, and yeah, yeah. it might not be that easy to tell. But what the way you can tell is just that the ink is ever so slightly more consistent. Yeah. In how it's been laid on the paper and. Whereas you can see a slight more variation in where it goes light dark, where there might have been a little more water, mm. the watercolour here. And have you so, been using the Chinese brush for that one? Sorry? Have you been using the Chinese brush? Yes, so I used the, mm. my smaller Chinese brush. Did you wet one. the paper before you um, nope. put the ink and the watercolour? No, nope. so the paper's dry, yeah. it's just uh, again, with that's the nice thing about these brushes is they hold a lot of liquid. So when you put it down, you get these beautiful because um, even with the slight variation, that's yeah, you know very nice, consistent very fragile. areas of color because they're they're very wet. So you get a nice consistency like that. It'd be very you might get more variation if I was to use a smaller brush, standard brush to do to do that and. You can do it then, you know, you, you, you can get um, nice even layers like this with the types of brushes we've been using. You just got to make sure uh, it's very loaded, uh, nice and wet, so no area dries. The advantage of maybe using a brush like that for this type of thing is you're only doing one or two strokes. So you're guaranteed almost to get a nice consistent because uh, everything will remain wet as you're as you're working. So with the ink one, you can just see it's just a tad, not a huge amount, but just a little more consistent in colour. And it's because it's dye based, it stains the colour, uh, it stains the paper more strongly than watercolour. So if you're ever wondering why I might use 
ink over watercolour. But that's if you want your areas of colour to be more likely to be kind of flatter, maybe even brighter and stronger as well, then you might use uh, ink. But if you want that sort of natural or almost accidental variation, I think, and both have pros and cons with them, I think, you know, in terms of it's a subjective thing, then you might go for uh, watercolour there. Uh, just to show variations in paper as well, this ink one was done on uh, 300 gram cotton based paper, so good quality paper, and then this was done on uh, quite, do you remember the cartridge paper we used at class? It was quite cheap cartridge, I quite like it actually, um, but it's it's not particularly special thick cartridge paper. So you can see difference in the in the paper, how it just means there's a little more variation where areas have dried a little quicker than they would on the cotton paper. But again, within simple shapes, that can be rather nice. It takes something simple, gives it a bit of texture and variety. So don't worry about what paper you have. You might, even if you haven't got the paper you desire, you can maybe get things out of it. You just have to maybe work it a little quicker. Uh, and just be careful of that. So you have to be, you know, quite decisive to get these um, uh, nice even uh, patches. This is another ink example. So with the previous ink example, I did a lot of color mixing and little variations. So I had a bit of green and put some purple and a bit of brown in. Here I didn't, I just used the color with a little bit of mixing and it's brighter on camera than I can see it, but it's still quite bright. So ink colors, if you take them out of the pot and just mix them a little bit, they'll still be quite bright. You have to kind of work at them in terms of mixing because they're just, they are naturally just stronger colors than you might have in uh, a water with watercolor as well. So um, some of you might have tried it and a bit bright. You just have to work with the mixing a little, a little bit more as well. Okay. Uh, and again, just little things that you can do. So, like I say, we're just dealing with simple shapes, but that doesn't mean you can't create something, have some complexity in it as well. So what I like about doing something like this is once you've done it a few times, you can get confident with the shapes and then you can really start to experiment what you do with them. And uh, also, if you have a repeating element that we've seen, if, so if you have lots of leaves, boom, 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 and doing something a little bit different with each leaf or each other leaf, and how that can create an interesting dynamic uh, like that. So this is just a partial one, but each one has just got a slightly different consistency. Each leaf, in terms of how we this is a gouache, by the way, and just a, a slightly different consistency, and on cartridge paper as well, where I know I'm going to get less evenness my patches of colour like that. Okay. Um, and lastly, uh, just thinking about what you could uh, draw in this situation. Remember, cropping um, uh, is worth exploring. It could be something simple, but have a look around. Uh, what's available, you know, you might be able to pick things up in the park uh, and so on. You might have other bits of nature around you. It doesn't have to be plants. You could do this with antlers or something like that. You can think about what, you know, feel free to explore what's around you, but it's a good place uh, to start. Uh, next week, we're going to look at a varying uh, block shapes with linear shapes and maybe look into beyond kind of nature into man-made objects and things like that uh, but here's just some variation again and just going through the process just remind you a little bit of the process you could try so here's just a single thing 
deliberately cropped on the page and then variations in color like so light and dark I think things like this make um, very pretty little images again using uh, a rigger brush in this instance as well and then even pushing that a little bit further in terms of variations third variation of color and so on so those are the processes uh, I've been trying out that have been therapeutic to me that may be therapeutic to you That was the end of the demonstration part of this particular online uh, session. Uh, thank you very much for watching.